glad you made it out to Wednesday night services tonight, the last night of our revival. And so we just ask you to find your seat, grab your hymn book, turn to hymn number 216 this evening. Hymn 216, dwell in the new land. Sometimes Jesus Christ sent his disciples into a storm. Yeah. Did he not? Yes. When he told them to cross the Sea of Galilee, there was a reason for that, to Amen. test them to prove them. The Lord does that to us as well, right? So let those stormy breezes blow. Their cry cannot alarm me. Lift it up to the Lord.
thing in dwelling in Butyl land. Unfortunately, there's many a Christian who are dwelling in the wilderness. Forty years they wandered around the wilderness. And all times we, we bewail the wilderness. But stop and think about the blessings of God even while they were in the wilderness. God fed them and he clothed them and he protected them and he guided them. Even though they were in the wilderness, God didn't leave them. Never did. And so tonight, maybe you're dwelling in beautiful land. There's one of you who is. Amen. And uh, hey, maybe tonight you're in the wilderness. Hey, you better get to that Jordan River and cross on over, right? And uh, that Jordan River, hey, that doesn't, it's not picturing death, uh, the physical death, so you can go in the promised land and drive out the Canaanites, right? They're in heaven, you're not driving out anyone. But it's death to self. And uh, praise the Lord. That's how you're going to get to Butyl Land. And it's sure good to see you. Maybe, maybe tonight, it was Wednesday night, and uh, you've been here all week long, and you're tired. It's, it's that midweek, you know. And, and, and maybe for a moment, you laid down on the couch or sat on the couch, maybe even had a recliner, and you put that thing in first gear this, this afternoon, right? And, and as you did, your flesh said, oh, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> and you said, oh, I need to get up and get ready to go to church tonight. And your flesh says, why don't you, you've been here all week, why don't you just take a night off? And you say, oh, I guess I could. And then the Holy Spirit says, really? It's Wednesday night. Oh, you know how you got here? Crossing the Jordan River, death to self, right? And that's how you get to Butyl Land. Hey, it got up and you're here. And I'm glad to see you tonight. Thank you for being here. Uh, how exciting it is for this last night of our revival. Amen. It's a bittersweet thing. It's last night and it's a whoo, the Lord's going to do something. And then it's the last night. Oh, I, I was, how many of you are tired? A few of you, good, 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 good. If you're not tired, you hadn't done anything all week. And, uh, and you know, I, was, I asked Brother Seifert, I said, how you doing, Brother Seifert? I said, oh, I'm tired. I said, imagine those 30-day revivals. I wonder if we got room on the calendar next year. Yeah. Somebody said, oh, oof. I said, we might have to adjust some things, right? But, uh, hey, praise the Lord. I'm glad that you're here tonight. It's good to have some guests with us this evening. And, uh, you know, as, as we have a revival, as we also have church services, we're always inviting people to come. And, and, and how many of you, like me, you invite a lot of folks, and some folks come and some folks don't. And, and so the fun, folks that actually show up, Man, we're excited about that, and uh, we're glad that you're here. Miss Lois, it's good to have you here uh, tonight. Uh, brother, brother Seifert and uh, Joseph knocked on her door just a few weeks ago and uh, led her to Christ, and she trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior, and praise the Lord for that. And she was just telling uh, Mr. Seifert a story, and I think I overheard part of it. She was, she was thinking and praying about a church to go to, and the next thing she knows, knock on the door. And uh, that's, hey, the Lord does that, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. He, yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amen. Hey, what we do at our house, we got company and it's church time. We say, hey, come on, let's go. We're going to church. And, and when we tell them we're going, they're like, well, you're going, no, come on, let's go with us. Oh, we got to go. Oh. You know, hey, one way or the other, they're, they're going to come with you or they're going to go. And so, yeah, definitely, definitely. We're glad that you're here tonight. Thank you for being here. It's good to have the shipping family all the way from Gainesville that drove, drove on down. And a uh, long trip, but now glad that they're here to stopping in, saying hello. And uh, they're preparing for the missionary trail, deputation uh, to go to Germany as missionaries. And uh, so make sure to get by. Grab one of their prayer cards. He might have a few of them on them. And uh, he might even let you pray for them. Maybe. I think we all right, brother Shipman. Be all right. Okay, Amen. And so, grab his prayer card and uh, and add them to your to your prayer cards, and you pray for them as they as they prepare to again hit deputation and, and reach the field of Germany. And I'm glad to have you all here this evening. And uh, looking around, I thought there was somebody else. Was I? Uh, brother, that's what it was. Thank you, brother Sight. And uh, good to see you here tonight as well. I knew there was somebody I was going to point out, and I, and I you know. ADD kicked in and I got distracted. And that's good to see Brother Side. Thank you for being here. Did your wife make it to the Philippines okay? She's made it to Hong Kong, okay. Amen. Probably so, yes, sir. But uh, we'll continue to pray for safety for her as she's traveling there. It was good to see you this evening. Brother Who, would you ask the Lord to bless our service tonight?
Amen. While you're still standing, hey, you're catching up. Look at that. Nobody sat down tonight. And uh, hey, you open your hymn book to 479. 479. Two verses we're going to sing. Come, Holy Spirit, and ushers after this song. If you'll get ready for our regular Wednesday night offering, we'll take up the offering right after this song and uh, right before Brother Ogden comes to preach. So 479. Sing out loud. normal Wednesday night, uh, tithes and offerings, and we'll take up a love offering at the end of the service, but this is for normal uh, Wednesday night offering. Um, just want to remind you, church, that uh, if you have any prayer needs, if you'll put those in the offering plate, and uh, we'll get those to everybody. Grab a prayer list on your way out as well. Uh, for sake of time, we won't go over that, but you can you can look at the prayer list and, uh, and, and see all the needs that are on there and just be in prayer one for the other. Yeah. And uh, let's pray and ask the Lord's blessings on this offering. And it's exciting to be able to give unto the Lord. Brother Chad, would you ask the Lord's blessings tonight, please, sir? Telling the story last night, and again, like the ADD kicked in. I got a little distracted. 
telling the story of when we had the opportunity to go to uh, Myrtle Springs and Wills Point and uh, go out in that area to see uh, where Brother Smith grew up and, and, and see some of the places uh, that we'd always heard stories about as he would preach and how exciting that was. And part of that, uh, part of that tour as well was going into uh, Wills Point. And uh, in Wills Point, there was a uh, old red brick building, an old feed store. And there was a metal stairs that went up the side of the building up to a, I think it was a red door. Was it, was it a red door up at the top? I can't remember now. It's been so many years and I'm getting a little older. And so, general merchandise store, okay. And, uh, but I remember seeing that brick building and you said, why, why do you remember that brick building? Because that brick building was where Brother Carl Ogde started the Trinity Baptist Church in Wills Point. Now, don't get that confused with the Trinity Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas, where Brother Smith pastored, and uh, two different churches. And if you ask Jeremy Ogde, the one in Wills Point is the Trinity Baptist Church, and all the others are just Trinity. And so uh, that's what Jeremy Ogde says, and what does he know? And uh, but <laughs> ask his dad, what does he know? And uh, but uh, uh, Brother Ogde would, would point out and would remind us and tell us a story of how he started that church. And can you imagine inviting somebody to church, and, and they had to climb up the stairs. Right? If you want to go to church, you got to go upstairs. And hey, so for some of us, that would be difficult, wouldn't it? And, uh, and yet, God put his hand upon it and blessed it. And then one day, gave him a building, and, and God began to work. And I remember see, hearing that story, Brother Ogden, and thought, well, what would it be like to one day start a church in a place like that? Knowing, not knowing that one day, we'd be in an old modular building with five pews. I remember a day when somebody came to church or someone knocked on their door. They lived over off of 1st Street here in town. And when they left, they said, I overheard the, the daughter saying to the mother, I've never been to church in a mobile home before. <laughs> I thought it's not a mobile home, but uh, oh well. And you know what? A, you can put a church anywhere. The church is not the building. The church is the people. And, but thank God for what he's given us. And, and we appreciate God's blessing upon our church. But it would be nothing. This building would be nothing without the people. And we rejoice that the, it's full of people tonight. Brother Ogdy, thank you for your faithfulness for many years. Thank you for being our friend in the ministry. You come and preach to us tonight and give us what God's given you this evening. Thank you, preacher. Second Timothy chapter 2. Oh, yep. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate you. it. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> Brought back a lot of memories talking about that place. I won't have time to get into it tonight. But it was a journey. It ended well. We just celebrated the 35th year of that church. This past June, just a couple months ago, three months ago, whatever, my son now has been pastor there longer than I was. And uh, he's let me know that every day of the week, I think, since then. But uh, they're doing a great, great work down there. Nothing like starting a church. And uh, we love doing it. Out of that church, we started uh, three others. One of them in uh, Idaho, a small church there. One of them in, in uh, Terrell, Texas. And uh, the other one went blank. Anyhow, three out of that little church down there, and, and that's what it's about, getting churches started, getting people in there, pastors in there, people in there, and doing what you're doing right here at Victory. Let me just say something to Victory. I love coming here. I love coming here and fellowshipping with you. Uh, it's a fellowshipping church. Amen. It's a singing church. Yes. In fact, I wish you'd amen as loud as you sing. <laughs> amen. amen. And uh, so anyways, uh, we just enjoy ladies always, men too for that matter. If you do any of the cooking, uh, it's been great all week long and we've enjoyed being here. And, uh, and uh, we even thought time before, had, I guess a couple years ago, I said, boy, it'd be good to be a member down there. And then we ended up in a big church over where Brother Smith was and got lost in it, you know, and everything. No, it's a good church, but last year doing a great job there. Before I read, listen to me carefully. Before I begin the message tonight, I want to begin by telling you that you don't have to read in the Bible very far to realize that a fight ensued, first of all, in the Garden of Eden between good and evil, between Satan and man, Satan and God. And then the fight between two brothers, you'll recall, Cain and Abel which ended in murder, the first murder we ever read about in, in man's history. And then there was a battle that we read about in Genesis 3.15 between Christ and Satan. By the way, Christ got that victory. Amen? Amen. Amen? We're just waiting to lock Satan up one day. 
There's been fighting in the Bible between good and evil, righteousness and unrighteousness ever since that day. Yes. And it hadn't gotten any lighter. In fact, if anything, it's gotten heavier. Yes. Fighting between people, Israel and their enemies, war, battles, death, uh, if you will, uh, 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 death of a nation, death of a, uh, of a people, death of different character, uh, in the, characters in the Bible. Fighting among our own political people today. You see it going on with our leadership in our news uh, outlets, if you will, fighting among ourselves in our local churches through what you call different uh, bodies of Christ out there. They call them fellowships, etc. All that's going on. Fighting against God's will for our lives if, if we're not careful. I got thinking about that and I was reading here a while back and I don't, didn't know why I cut it out of all things, but I cut this out. It's been quite a while back, but I want you to listen to it. Abraham Lincoln, who said it best when delivering his famous Gettysburg Address, said this, and I quote, he said, it is for the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, talking about the Civil War, you remember that, from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of their devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. And when I cut that out, I like Civil War and like reading about it. When I cut that out, I just laid it over on my desk and I know why now. When you think about that, let me just go back and get this phrase. It is for the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they all fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. There have been a lot of martyrs of Christ. Yes, there have been a lot of deaths of God's people from the beginning even to this day. There have been those who have given their life on a foreign field and given their life serving God, even in the local churches like yours. And it would do us well to grab the attention like Abraham Lincoln did of the people in that day and understand the fight's not over. But the fight that we need to be fighting now is the one he tried to get them. It's a fight of right. It's a fight of righteousness, if you will. And he was trying to advance this crowd in that day to move beyond the war between themselves and move beyond till you get to the, to, uh, to the life of living for God. And that's what our nation was birthed on, if you will, even in the beginning. And I want you to listen to me tonight on purpose. All of us here tonight remember the Alamo. If you're from Texas, I hope you do. And the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, if you've ever been there, if you look carefully as you go through the door of that that, that building there, on there is a little bitty sign, not very big. On that sign, Colonel Travis back then had been told by the enemy commander to lay down their weapons and surrender or else his entire force of men would be killed in that battle. And that literal marking is there today. In fact, there is a literal marking. If you go and ever go again, look, there's a line drawn right down below it there where supposedly the literal line was drawn that uh, uh, Colonel Travis had drawn in that day. That little marking of that line at the entranceway of the Alamo, when you walk through there, reminds us of the story there where Travis took out his sword and drew that line, realizing what he had been told by the enemy and uh, by the general's men who had been sent to tell him that they would all die. He asked his men that day to choose fate realizing what would happen. Surrender or meet ultimate death. But doing so would help toward the founding of the great state of Texas and the freedom from oppression. All the men that day but one crossed that line knowing full well that they were going to have to give their lives in that battle, and they did. They not only gave their lives in that battle, ladies and gentlemen, but they were burned uh, even to the bones to, if you will, powdered, if you will, before they left there. We all know later that Sam Houston, there at San Jacinto, finally beat the Mexican general and his men. Are you listening to me?
because a body of men, and there were women there that they let loose and go, but the body of men knowing that there had already been some who had died to try to grant, uh, gain the freedom, if you will, of oppression from Mexico and, and, and on and on and on. I can't get into all of it. Other than the fact that that day, Colonel Travis knew that. And as he stood before all those men out there, he wanted them to remember why they were there, and he told them that. And again, I can't develop all that tonight. I don't want to do that. But I want you to understand he drew a line. If anything else, you, or nothing else you get out of this message tonight, I'm going to draw a line tonight. Amen. I'm going to draw a line on behalf of God, on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ, on behalf of souls around the world. The cry in that day was remember the Alamo. And to this day, you hear it from time to time. You know, maybe it would be good if somebody would remember Victory Baptist Church in Sanger, Texas. And all because you decided to give your lives, and not necessarily to die other than to die to ourselves, but to give your lives to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. The fight went on, and the fight is still going on in our lives today against righteousness and unrighteousness, against good and evil, fighting among our own, and that ought not be, but it happens sometimes. With that fight in mind, I want you to look at 2 Timothy now, chapter 2. The Bible said, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Thank you for standing. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now pay attention here. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him, watch it now, who hath chosen him uh, to be a soldier. Do you realize God has chosen you and I who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb to be a soldier of Christ? Amen. To be a soldier of the gospel? To be a soldier of the Word of God? To stand forth even if it means death? And literally, if you've never read the Fox's Book of Martyrs and uh, Trail of Blood, you ought to read it because literally hundreds and even thousands over the year have given themselves, given their life to get the gospel to people in Germany, if you will, in Europe, in China, other places. And, and we can't even get people to go out into a neighborhood in our, in our churches anymore. Yes, that's right. God's drawn a line tonight. He wants to know if you'll join him on this side with that fight against evil and that fight against the devil, if you will. Look a little bit farther here, if you will. Look at 2 Timothy, or excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Just go back here. Let me read a couple of scriptures to you. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. But thou, O man of God, Paul talking to uh, Timothy, the young preacher, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. You ought to read what those things are up and above on your own. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. It's a good fight, ladies and gentlemen. It's a fight for the souls of man. It's a fight for righteousness, if you will. And there's so much more, I can't say it all. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, you know this well. Paul said in verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at end. He said, here it is, I have fought a good fight. Ladies and gentlemen, the Christian life is to be a fight. And I think so many of us have gone AWOL. Yes, if you don't know what AWOL is, it's absent without leave in the military. You've gone off, you've deserted, you've gone where? By the way, I was in Vietnam, and at that time there were men and women going to Canada to escape serving their country. Are y'all listening? And I had no time of day for them. Now, if they need to get saved, fine. But just to sit down and talk about the good old time, they had nothing to do with it. Yes, sir. Yeah. There were literally thousands, over 50,000, some of them said over 60, but 50 some odd thousand, 58 I think it is, that died in Vietnam trying to help those people over there that wanted some form of democracy and out of the bonds of uh, uh, the, the enemy, if you will. One other scripture, and then he'll be seated after prayer. Jude 3. Jude and verse number 3. 
Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. I preached out of this years ago up in uh, 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 Chicago area, Illinois, and I got to looking at this to study. It earnestly contend talks about a contender, a heavyweight contender, a fighter. You and I are to be heavyweights for God. We're to be contenders. We're to be fighters. I'm not talking about fighting against each other. I'm not even talking about fighting against the enemy uh, as such in a physical way, but in a spiritual way, that's our responsibility as soldiers for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to preach on this subject tonight, frontliners. Frontliners. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the privilege and honor to be here in this church. What a blessing. What a privilege to be here. Help me, Lord, to be a blessing tonight. And help me, Lord, to say what I need to say and get out of the way so Dr. Smith can get up and close out this great meeting that you've given us this week. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake only we ask it all. Amen and amen. You may be seated. God desires for us who have been born again to remember that we are in that fight. He calls it a good fight. It's a good fight against Satan. It's a good fight against evil. It's a good fight against wickedness. It's even a good fight against personal sin in our own life. It's a fight against the flesh that we battle with every single day of our life. And it's a battle, you heard it last night, of our minds every single day. And that battle is still raging, and I believe it's even raging more today than ever before due to the avenues of social media and other things that are out there to grab the attention of people. Yes. Satan is still recruiting, and he's building his army of imps against God's people every day, against uh, uh, the souls of men, women, boys, and girls, against all that's good, all that's righteous that God wants us to be a part of. There's a road sign now, maybe you've seen it, that lead out on the highway that, that, that has been put up there and paid for. And it reads about the birth of Christ in Christianity. And now beside that, it called it fake news. It's on your nation's highway. Miss Adia and I have seen it as we traveled. Talks about Christ, talks about Christianity, but in a negative way, and they reach out and call it fake news. Well, I got news for them. It's not fake news. But it's on our nation's highways. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, our God has provided, listen to me now, everything you and I need to fight that good fight. Everything we need to stand against that diabolical, deadly, and destructive plans and forces of the devil. And as we said last night, he's walking about seeking whom he may devour. And if you're not careful, you'll be next. If you're here tonight, you're a child of God, it all never happened. But I've seen the devil get a hold of children of God and destroy their marriages and destroy their homes and destroy their lives, destroy their effectiveness, if you will, destroy preachers over and over. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. In the book of Ephesians chapter 6, it has a whole armor of God. You know it well. But I want to look at a little bit of it with you. Ephesians chapter 6, we'll look down and begin to read in verse number 10. The Bible said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you, it says it again, the whole armor of God. We ought not leave home without it, if you will. Amen. Everything needs to be in place. He said that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand there for having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith all, or wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with pray, all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, God has given to every one of us as soldiers, men, women, young, old, every single one of us has given everything we need to be a good soldier for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I remember joining the, uh, uh, the Air Force back in 70 and, and raising my hand over in Dallas and, uh, and, and repeating, you know, and next thing I know I'm at boot camp. I remember all that. But you want to know, know a, a, a young man who wanted to be the best soldier he could be? It was me. I wanted to be the best soldier I could be. I wanted to be the best uh, aircraft mechanic I could be. I wanted to be, I just wanted to serve my country. Where's that pride any longer? He said, it's out there. It's just not like it was before. And by the way, I want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to be a good soldier. I want to be the top soldier for the Lord. How about you? Amen. And whatever it takes, and by the way, it's coming today where it might, if he tears it's coming, it may take your life. Yes. May very well. But we have our orders here. We have our orders. We have our armor, the whole armor given to us by God. We have our assignment, if you will, to go forth and try to defeat evil and wickedness, realizing it's there. We're, we, we give it that armor to be able to go out and, and uh, go soul winning and plant churches and win people to Christ. Everything's been given to us. It's been given to us spiritually. It's been given to us mentally. It's been given to us verbally. It's been given to us physically. And might I add, it's been given to us supernaturally as well. Look at Romans 8. Y'all okay Turn it in your Bible? Amen. Oh, good, because I am. I heard somebody say, one of the preachers say, you know, you can't in improve upon God's Word. Yeah. Sometimes we try to add everything and make it flashy, and the Word of God's powerful. Amen. Amen. Look at Romans chapter 8. I love this. Look down at verse 31. You know it. You've got it highlighted. And not, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us... <laughs> Does your Bible say who can be against us? You realize if you're for God, God's for you, there's nothing that can come against you and destroy you. Watch this in verse 37. It gets even better. It said, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Not only conquered, more than conquerors. Amen. Why? Because Jesus Christ not only died, was buried, but he rose again on that third day. Amen. We have salvation, but we have eternal life. To be absent from the body, be present, Lord. That's more than being, being conquerors, if you will. Watch this. For I am persuaded, verse 38, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principality, nor powers, nor things uh, present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I believe today that there are those who stand against evil and stand against sin, stand against Satan, if you will. But I also believe there are those who used to stand against it. There are those who've given up on that. They used to stand against evil and sin and used to stand against the devil and used to be faithful to God, but not so much anymore. A soldier chosen by God himself is to be a good soldier. Amen. I hope you want to be a good soldier tonight. Yes, a good soldier will obey his commanding officer's orders. Are y'all with me? Amen. I can tell you right now, when I was in the service, if you didn't obey, you got in trouble. Can I say, Christian, when we don't obey, we get in trouble. Yes, sir. I remember some of them that went AWOL while they were in uh, uh, boot camp, tried to escape. They got caught. They got put in the brig, if you will. They didn't get away with it. Are y'all listening? Can I say to you, we're not going to get away with it if we try to go away, Wall. Right. Yeah. If we try just to back up, back out, stay idle, it's not going to work. Yes, we're to stand against the diabolical, deadly, and destructive plans and forces of evil and the devil, and we do that by wearing the entire armor of Almighty God that He's given us. I like what He said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of of his might. A good soldier will fight. And a good soldier will endure hardness as a good soldier. A good soldier will stand strong in their Christian life. They'll stand fast. They'll stand ready against evil and against the devil, if you will. I remember a man by the name of Stephen who stood as he was being stoned to death. Some have referred to him as a deacon. I know this. He was an evangelist the day he got stoned because he was preaching the Word of God. Amen. 
And I'm telling you, if you ever go back and read that and Acts 7, you'll find out that it was a powerful, pointed message. And they didn't like it. And they gnashed upon him with their teeth. And they stoned him right there in that day. He died under the attack of those stones. You say, oh, I thought God was for us. He is. He's with God right now. But hang on. Let me tell you what that soldier did. That soldier started a wildfire. Yes, sir. And let me tell you why. Because the day he was st standing there being stoned to death, stood a man just to the side of him named Saul. Yes, sir. And I know Saul got saved on the road to, Ma to Damascus. I know that. And I know that God had a victory in that. And he became the greatest apostle outside of Christ. I mentioned that earlier this week. But little did Paul later know what, saw, or what Stephen knew that day until it became his time that we read a moment ago. I fought a good fight. Amen. That soldier, Paul, learned by watching a young man by the name of Stephen, yes. seeing him give his life. And ladies and gentlemen, I haven't seen God ask for your, your and my life in a physical way. He could and he might, but he is asking for us in a physical way to live for him Amen. in this day and in this hour. I call these fighters contenders for the faith, once delivered unto the same. Let me tell you what kind of people we got today. Number one tonight, we got frontliners. Go back to our text now, if you will. Just go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I'll hurry here, but I want you to see this. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look down at verse number 3 again. Thou therefore endure what? Hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. We got too many Christians wrapped up in the affairs of this life. Right. It's been mentioned this week, we got credit cards run to the hilt. We can't tithe. I've had them come into my office over the years as a pastor said, Preacher, we, do, we just can't tithe right now. And you talk to them, find out they're in debt. And I said, Well, I can't help you until you start tithing. Once you start tithing, you've got a chance to get out of the hole that you're in. Yes, sir. If you're here tonight and you're not tithing, you're not going to get very far. Right. Yes, sir. You might as well go ahead and start obeying God and tithing unto God. By the way, that's what a good soldier will do. Yes, sir. It'll not be easy. It may even be hard. But we're to endure hardness as a good soldier. Yes, Frontliners. Frontline soldiers of Christ. Those who choose to obey their commander-in-chief those who are referred to in here as good soldiers. And when that soldier's called on to fight, there's no question. They just stand forth. And having done all, they stand. And they endure. They're faithful. There's hard time, trouble times, dangerous time, times of turmoil. Even the unexpected happens in their lives just like it does yours and mine. And God is there. If God be for us, who can be against us? You know, the reason we know that these soldiers here, these fighters in the faith and of the faith are frontliners is partially seen in that scripture I read a moment ago. No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life. I don't remember anybody when I was in Vietnam worried about everything going on back home. Are y'all listening? They're worried about living. They're worried about making it through the next day. Oh, they want to go home. They want to see their wife. They want to see their kids, their mom, their dad, their girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever it might be. But they're worried about staying alive. And they're over there to help others. Child of God, we're here to help others. Amen. We're here to help others stay out of hell, give them a home in heaven. Amen. What kind of a soldier are you tonight? Are you one that's crossed that line and said, I'll serve, even if I die, I'm going to serve God Amen. with my entire life. Amen. No man that warth entangled himself with the affairs of this life. And I said it a moment ago, I'll say it again. We're too entangled with the affairs of this life. Yep. Yes, sir. Too entangled. Now hear me. A frontliner. I remember the frontliner. You'll know the story well, and you'll catch up on it before I get there. He was a Marine, and you'll know him well, but that Marine one morning, his sergeant started out, and they were to uh, 
uh, uh, take a, uh, go out into the jungle and check things out and check for uh, mines and traps and the enemy, of course, and in Vietnam. And they took off and they went out a little bit farther there. And, and this young man asked the uh, sergeant if he could take lead. He said, okay, all right, take lead. And it started raining. It was raining cats and dogs that time over there. And they began to walk out and break my neck here. They began to walk out there. They hadn't got 30, 40 yards, and all of a sudden, boom! And that boy that wanted to take lead for his men, the sergeant, blew his legs all to pieces. There was raining cats and dogs. He'd laying there bleeding profusely, and, and he just wanted to serve God, wanting to make a difference, if you will. And he got up there, and his legs all mangled and bleeding and blood. And all they could do is call for the medics at that time. And there was a black sergeant, that was his sergeant, that leaned over him and began to pray for him right there. A young man had to come back to the stage, went through several, many, many surgeries. Then and later on, he lost his legs right here. One a little bit higher than the other. Some of you know who I'm talking about already. But hang on. Hang on. He's willing to do whatever it needed to help others. He lost both them legs, but let me tell you what happened before that. He wasn't a good soldier. He wasn't fighting the fight of faith. He ran from God. His daddy tried to keep him from doing it. Daddy was a preacher, but he ran from God. Joined the Marines and went over to Vietnam, and this happened to him. And then later, when all of that took place, and he came back to the States and started healing, he still had no legs. Well, Mike told this, and he was a track star in the state of Oklahoma. He set records that nobody else had even beaten, maybe not even to this day. His name, Evangelist Tim Lee. Tim Lee was among the fundamentalists for years. He's in different groups now. I don't know. I have heard his testimony. It's, in. it's the same. But what he did, he always preached a message on, I got what I wanted, but I lost what I had. Amen. You willing to lose something over it? You willing to lose a marriage over it? You willing to lose a family over it? You willing to lose a church over it? You willing to lose your class over it? You willing to lose your, your ministry over it? You willing to lose your life over it? It's time, ladies and gentlemen, as good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ, to step across that line and say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, whatever I need to do to get there, help me get there. Amen. We're living a life of ease as children of God today. I want to be a frontliner, amen? amen? Let me just give you a quick couple of things here that you'll know really well. And, and, uh, and, and hear me well now, Abraham was a frontliner for a while. Remember when God called him out of the Ur of Chaldees? Y'all remember that story? He went out. Hebrews said he went out by faith, not knowing whether he went. I mean, that, that's pretty good. I mean, that's faith. He went out, but he got out there, and there's some trouble in the world. Remember that famine broke out? What did he do? He dropped down into Egypt for a few years. Hello? Now, I know you've been told this is elementary, but Egypt, uh, Egypt in the Bible is a type of the what? World. world. He dropped down in the world. He took Lot with him. They got down there and become wealthy. They come out of there years later wealthy, trying to get back on track for God. We know what happened with Lot. But there was another young lady he brought out with him. You better remember her name. Yeah, how'd that turn out? We're fighting them over there right now. I said we're fighting them over there right now. All because they went down into the world for a short period of time in all reality. Yes. Amen. God finally gave Abraham and Sarah that promised seed, though. Amen. Amen. But it took some sacrifice to a point where he was asked to give his son as a sacrifice. Remember that? My wife doesn't like me to tell this story in this matter. I always said, I think that about the time uh, he was going to offer up his son a sacrifice, he had that big old knife down there. I believe he might have even broke blood on his, on his son's neck. All of a sudden, that ram was caught in a thicket. Remember that? Why? Because he returned to the fight. He went back in and served God with his life uh, from that day. How many remember King David? Everybody remember King David, a man after God's own heart, uh, apple of God's eye? You heard it this week. Remember him? 
Remember how great he was? He defeated Goliath. But there was a battle going on, and you know the story. He stayed home from the battle. The devil said, you know what? You're the king. You know, you've been in church a long time. You don't have to do everything. He stayed home just for that short period of time. He couldn't sleep. I believe the devil kept him home. God kept him awake. He got up, wandered around, wondering, what am I doing here? I ought to be out there on the battlefield. He wandered over the edge and precipice of that, that, that castle there. He looked down, and there was Bathsheba. Everybody remember Bathsheba? How'd that turn out? I believe a little boy died from that, didn't he? Huh? I believe that Bathsheba's husband was put on the front of the line and was murdered, if you will. Come on. But yet these are men of God that started out in the fight and they backed up with one thing or another and hey, it don't take much to get out of the fight. Yes, sir. It sure takes a lot to stay in the fight. Yes. <laughs> True stories, by the way. Oh, I could pick others out. People I know, people you know. Used to be on fire for God, in, soul winning, working a bus ministry, teaching a class, doing something worthy of God and all of a sudden, whatever it was that triggered it, but they're gone. They're out. They're out of the church. They're out of the pulpit. No longer leading music. I've seen that happen. Abraham went AWOL. Lot, he just went. You know the rest of the story there. Now listen carefully. They at one time were frontliners. I don't know about you, but if I killed Goliath, I believe that means I was on the front line when his brothers couldn't do it, the rest of the army of Israel couldn't do it. Isn't that right? Isn't that what the Bible teaches? And one little old, I think it was just a little old redhead, freckles all over him, didn't have muscle in it. I don't know, but I know one thing. He took a rock and a sling. Look up here. If God be for us, what? I believe that what happened is God got a hold of that hand and that sling, and as soon as he spun around and turned loose, God said, Poof. Goliath died, by the way. And, and if it wasn't right then, he picked up his sword, cut his head off. Amen? You know, God's looking for some Davids that'll just stay on track. God's looking for some Abrahams by faith that'll just stay on track. You, know, you, you don't have to get off track just to see how it works. Just stay on track. Frontliners. Don't be a frontliner for a while and then be some sermon illustration later down the road and say, he didn't make it, she didn't make it. Huh. You know, David took that great psalm of Psalm 51 and repented in every way he knew how. And after that, God called him not only the apple of his eye, but a man after God's own heart. A true frontliner. Let me tell you who a true frontliner was that never left the track. We read it a while ago in the beginning. His name was Paul. He finished the fight. He fought a good fight. He finished his course. You know, if he did it, we can do it. Amen. And we ought to. It honors God. Honors God with our, with, with, with our lives. Honors God uh, and the work that he's called us unto. You know, when a person stays on the front lines, it helps others. And we're supposed to be about others souls of men, women, boys, and girls. Oh, I got to hurry. Secondly tonight, let me give you this. Not only a frontliner, but I've run into some people I call flatliners. Flatliners. A flatliner, there is a period that shows no activity on a person's heart and brain, if you will. Many times, death is the finality of it all. Somebody uh, reminded me that there was a movie or a show or whatever called Flatliners where they take them to the point of death and try to bring them back. Don't be messing with me like that, amen? I try to live every, every, every uh, second I can. And there's what others called, and I wrote it down so I'd try to pronounce it correctly, electroencephalogram. That's when there's no brain activity. Look up here. As a pastor, I've stood in, an, in a hospital room or emergency room when they turned everything off. When the brain activity went, they were gone. When the heart ceased to pump blood and there was no blood pressure, blood pressure, they were gone. Are y'all listening? And the thing about it is we've got some flatliners in our churches. They're almost gone, preacher. 
I said to them on going, I mean it. I love music. You ain't going to find anybody that loves music more than I, especially good gospel music. Amen. But we ought to get as excited about the Word of God and the will of God as we get about singing. Yeah. You ought to shout every once in a while when your preacher preaches. He's got the book of God and he's preaching truth and you ought to say, Amen. Yeah. Glory to God. Hallelujah, preacher. Preach it, preach it, preach it. Any way you want to do it. I guarantee you, you'll just cause him to say another half hour. <laughs> Frontliners, but then there is the flatliners. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a flatliner. Amen. I'm getting older. Things don't work like it used to. Some part of my bodies have already flatlined. <laughs> this is not too far away. <laughs> Amen. Some of you are that way and you're only 20 year old. You know, we call flatliners, those that are almost gone, backsliders. Yeah. You remember this scripture? Don't turn there, just listen very quickly. Proverbs 14, verse 11. Listen to it. The house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even the laughter of the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. That's what's happening today. Don't tell me what to do. Don't ask me to do what I don't want to do. I'm not. God's asking you. God's wanting you to be involved. Amen. And which, by the way, causes others to react the same way you do so many times. They're watching your life. Follow the same pattern that you're portraying out there. So, are you a frontliner or are you a flatliner just about to give it up? And there's a third one here. I call it a fault liner. I shared it with Brother Smith earlier. I didn't even have it in the message. I was driving home today from the dentist. It's amazing the things you think of after you come out of a dental office. Amen? <laughs> but y'all know that fault line out there in California? Y'all remember that? And so I just went into my notes and wrote that in there. <clears throat> and I got to thinking about that and, and thinking about the fact that I, I don't, you know, I don't want to be a, a flatliner. I'd rather be a frontliner, but I thought about that fault liner, and it talks about this. Some that are almost gone. Listen carefully. That has consequences. Read it. Read it up. Look it up in your dictionary. Yes, it talks about a fault line. But it talks about the fault line of men. It talks about it, and it even talks about it being spiritual, where you begin to, uh, 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 in, in your life, you find faults, things that happen, and it takes you away uh, from your focus on God and your focus on the things of God. And it goes on to say, and there's consequences. You do remember there's consequences for sin? Huh? There's consequences for sin. There's consequences for going AWOL and not being a good soldier. Absent without leave. Uh, they called it something different today, but that's in my day. You were absent without leave, and you ended up in the brig, if you will, the jail, if you got caught. Some of them just went to Canada. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, only one chance is all you get. One chance. I'd rather be a flatliner, a frontliner than a flatliner. But I don't want to be a fault liner either. I don't want God to find fault in me. I don't want others to find fault in me. I want them to see a good soldier enduring hardness for the cause of Christ. Then may I say this, and I'll be done. There are those I call false liners. Now, won't you listen to me? Take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 7. I've said it all week. For whatever reason, God's had me talk about this in all the messages I've preached on this week. Matthew chapter 7, you'll know it well. False liners. I'm not talking about your eyeliner liner ladies. <laughs> Most time the eyes and the liners and everything else is false. But anyways. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be, watch out, many there be which go in thereat. Had a lot of people dropping off into hell, even as we speak tonight. Verse 14. Because straight is the gate and narrows the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. 
Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. In fact, when Paul left the church there, he reminded them to be careful of the wolves that would come in. And watch this, verse 60, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but every corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. And by the way, if you study closely and a pastor watches, he knows the fruits of the people. God knows it better, but he knows them. And he realizes something's not right. Here it is, verse 21. Not every one that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the what? the will of my Father which is in heaven. Question right here. Are you a frontliner? Or are you flatlining? Dying? Where are you at in your Christian life? It's going to make all the difference in building a church and reaching people for Christ. It's going to be, you're going to have to get on the front lines, if you will. But some of you are quickly and, and rapidly becoming flatliners, if you will fault liners, and you have consequences for that. Hear me now. One of the greatest consequences if you're not saved is hell. Yeah. Yes, sir. And I'm telling you right now, I don't know about here, but I've mentioned it all week. Our churches is full of people that will shout amen, that will sing your songs you lead them in. Are you all listening? But there's no fruit. You see them doing nothing or you see them not involved in the spiritual aspect of it, maybe some physical aspect from time to time, but they're lost. They're dying and going to hell and they think everything's all right because they're in church. They're singing out loud and singing strong, if you will, but they're not going to make it to heaven. How do you know? Because God said so. Look here, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devil in thy name done many wonderful work? That's a lot of things done right there, lady. I would think that's a spiritual person right there. You all see it? I don't know about you, but I've been saved a long time. I don't think I've ever cast out any devils. I've run some off from the church, but I don't ever cast out any. But watch this. And in the name done many wonderful things. Look at verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from you, ye that work iniquity. I don't know about you. If you'll read that back over, they do and look like some pretty spiritual thing to me. Casting out devils. Are y'all listening? But they're not going to heaven. They never trusted Christ as their Savior. He didn't know them. And I'm afraid that our fundamental independent Baptist churches are full of people that God does not know. I call them false liners. Those who have no idea. And you're more worried about, as I mentioned, I think yesterday, you're more worried about being embarrassed to get saved now after being a member here so long that you'll just let it go on and on until one day you either die or the trump of God sounds and you find yourself not standing before the Lord but standing before the devil in a place called hell. Yes. I think one of the reasons that, that so many people in our church doesn't do a lot anymore. Yes, some of them are spiritually immature, need to grow, need to get more involved. Yes, and you, if that's you, you need to do that. But some of them have no idea because you cannot discern the Word of God. If you can't discern the Word of God, you'll not act upon the Word of God. You'll not be obedient to the Word of God. And the only way to be able to discern the Word of God is by the Spirit of God, and you can't get the Spirit of God until you've been born again. Yeah. And when you get born again, you get saved, washed in the blood of the Lamb, God puts the Spirit of God in you forever. Amen. Then you can discern the Word of God. And then when your preacher gets up and preaches about it, you'll learn so much that will put you back on the front line for Jesus. I'll never forget when I got saved in that church. I tell you about it earlier. When I got saved there at Trinity that Wednesday night and had to stand in front of everybody so they can come by and laugh at me, whatever. And uh, I did. I thought they was all going to come by and say, well, you've been working with my young people and you wasn't saved? But I didn't mind. I stood out there and I was sweating under my arms and, and I was scared what I was. 
But a calm came over me, and I just took it. And I looked at them. They smiled at me. One deacon, five, one ear to the ear. He looked down at me, and he says, I knew it all along. <laughs> Look here. You pastor have been around some of you for a long time. He's known it a long time. Wouldn't it be good before this meeting's over with? When Brother Smith gets through and gives the invitation, wouldn't it be good if you just settled that matter tonight? Amen. Because when I got saved, listen to me, I was having so much trouble, preacher, trying to discern my Sunday school lesson that was typed up and handed to me in the book of Matthew. And when I got saved, as I live and breathe, automatically I sit down with the same lesson. And I begin, oh, wow. How is that? Holy Ghost. Power of God to discern the Word of God. Is there some things missing in your life? Are you where you really need to be in the Lord tonight? Because you're not ever going to maintain revival. I like what you preach. You said, we don't have to do this every year just to get revival. We ought to be maintaining revival. Amen. You can't do that unless you're on the front line. Yes. You can't do that as a flat liner, almost dead. You can't do that uh, as a fault liner. You can't do that as a false liner because you're dead in your sins. But God wants everybody to be saved. He wants you to be saved tonight. He wants you Christians that are saved to be right with Him and do what He said. Get on the front line, put on the whole armor of God, and get some victories in your life. Where are you at tonight? Where are you at? I know this, at least at this point in my life, I'm on the front line. And I'm going to stay there by the grace of God until Jesus comes. How about you? Let's bow our heads. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking about. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking back. As they're coming up here, let me just remind you this. You're the one who has to make the decision for your own life. Maybe some of you just backslidden. You need to repent on that. Maybe some of you need to be saved. You need to do that tonight before you do anything else in your life. Maybe God's speaking to some of you about special services. You need to answer that tonight. And I pray you'll do that during the invitation here in just a little bit. Father, we love you. I pray your power and presence on Dr. Smith, Lord. Bring it to a, 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 Lord, just bring it to a pinnacle tonight. Do something in the lives of the people here at Victory Baptist Church from the pastor all the way down to the nursery. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Rodney. Amen. <clears throat> Think of those flatliners and everyone knows that sound the machine makes when the machine goes yeah. flatline. Anyone that's lost somebody, you hear that, it breaks your heart. And how many Christians, spiritually, the beeping is getting slower and slower. We just know what's right around the corner. And you're breaking the heart of your brethren. Fault liners. I remember growing up in the 80s, they told us that by the time we get to 2000, California was going to break off the United States and fall into the Pacific Ocean. Anybody remember that? Yeah. That fault line causes division. Doesn't it? And how many Christians, you're a fault liner because you're causing division among the brethren. And what does God say about that? You're separating. We're talking ill about the brethren. And I mean, you don't have anything good to say. Hmm. Mm -mm. Let me ask you to be in prayer for these needs tonight. And uh, Miss Betty asked that we pray for her sister, who's 93 years old. And uh, Miss, uh, is that Dorothy Whitworth? And, uh, oh, your cousin. I'm sorry, your cousin. And uh, she's 93 years old. She's having surgery, bladder surgery, tomorrow about 1 o'clock. And so if you'd pray for her, um, she would appreciate that. Miss Janice asked that we pray for her dad. And uh, he's having surgery next week on Monday to remove part of his thyroid. So if you pray for Richard Parks, many of you know him, and uh, pray for that surgery. And then uh, Trey asks we continue to pray for his mom. She does have a doctor's appointment tomorrow morning, but a rough day today. And so uh, pray for those needs, if you will. Add them to your prayer list. If you hadn't picked it up, there is they are in the foyer. And so as you're on your way out, stop by and pick it up. We're going to sing one song tonight. And now go ahead and stand, stretch your legs, grab your hymn book. And uh, if you need to make a quick run to the restroom, there are two this way. There's one up this way for church members. You know where that's at. Uh, that way you don't have to stand in line. But uh, in the meantime, hey, everyone else, grab your hymn book and sing out loud this next song.
Amen. Let's turn to him number 160. Number 160. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. preacher comes we're going to sing a song but uh, we sure have enjoyed having Dr. Smith, Dr. Ogdy, Brother Gray that was with us past couple uh, nights and a uh, preacher's going to come and give us our closing sermon for the revival and I remember years ago as Dr. Smith started the Trinity Baptist Bible College uh, I was a deacon in the church at the time had the opportunity to attend there and listen to him as he would teach uh, certain classes and uh, some of those classes he would teach others he'd preach and sometimes both. But uh, I remember Dr. Smith, years, a few years into starting that, he started the Overliving Conference. He brought to our attention the fact that Moses did that which was right in the sight of God. Joshua followed after him. The elders followed after Joshua. But then after the elders, there arose a generation which knew not the works of God. Dr. Smith said, we need to be that generation that overlives, continues, keep reaching the next generation. Through those many years, Dr. Smith, the Lord always reminded me of that. And that thought, that seed, is what started this conference. Years ago, I thought of the, the ministry of Dr. Bob Smith and that number of faithful years and how it affected men like Carl Ogde and Todd Lassiter, who was, who's now the pastor at Trinity Baptist Church. 
how it affected folks in my generation and even my children and we just want to overlive we just want to keep going and it's not we're not just doing what dr smith did dr smith just taught what the word of god said and the same the scripture says commit thou also to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also preacher we thank you for your faithfulness of the years and your investment into our lives and our children and the next generation and we just pray that lord help us all to be faithful until he comes back so after we get done singing preacher you come looking forward to our final message for the evening so long i had searched for life's meaning and slain. Miss Lexi, you do a good job singing bass. <laughs> Amen. Excuse me, Gizmo, quit that. <laughs> Open your Bibles tonight to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 6, Isaiah, chapter 6. You know, the whole principle of this meeting and the whole principle of missions and soul winning is found in Psalm 145, verse 4. God's Word says, One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. You know how you heard the generation before you was faithful to tell you and proclaim the Word of God. And you know how the next generation's going to hear? We've got to be faithful. Or otherwise, we're going to end up like England, Germany, France, on and on and on. I want to be a frontliner. Amen. 
older I get, the easier it is to get tired. And I'm tired tonight. I kind of feel like a flatliner. <laughs> oh, the heartbeat's not as strong. The pulse is kind of wobbly. But, hey, you keep going. You keep going. Someone said, why don't you just quit? Man, the only, I, I, don't, I don't know how to quit. I don't know where the quitting place is except you die. You keep on going. You say, well, you can't do what you used to, but I can do what I can. And what an old man can do may be more than some of you young people are doing. We need to be faithful to do what we can. And what God needs done that you're not able to do, God will do it for you. Just learn to trust Him. We live in a world where people see everything little. But we ought to realize we've got a big God with unlimited power. We need to learn to trust Him. We don't have to fight every battle that's before us. He'll fight those battles for us. We just need to be faithful to Him and serve Him and just keep on serving. Thank you, Brother Ogdy, for the message. I don't want to be a flatliner. I don't want to ignore the fault lines. I want to be a frontliner. Have you found your place in Isaiah chapter 6? This is the last message of this meeting. We're going to leave here and go out into a hard, cruel, cold, heartless world. How are we going to make it out there? Well, I want to give you a biblical principle tonight that will help you to make it and finish strong and finish right. If you found your place in Isaiah 6, if you're able to stand physically, would you stand out of love and respect for the Word of God? The Bible says in verse number 1, Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I was listening to a preacher on the radio one time, KSKY, years ago. And there was a preacher from South Dallas on KSKY. And he, it was very evident he didn't have much of an education. And he said, in the year that King Uga died. <laughs> now, it's easy to laugh at him, but at least he's trying to use what he had for the Lord. What are you doing for the Lord? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And, it uh, and above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. By the way, up here in Sanger, if you don't speak King James Bible, twain means two. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his body, and with twain he did fly. Now there's three kinds of heavenly hosts the Bible talks about outside of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the saints that are there. They are cherubs, cherubim, seraphim, and angels. Now, the cherubs were over the mercy seat. A form of the cherubs, and their wings were outstretched. So we know they had a couple of wings, cherubs. Seraphim had six wings. And it tells you about them. We don't know that angels had any wings. And let me just tell you something else. Little babies that die, they don't become angels. They are 
people. Amen. When Jesus died on the cross, just as sin passed on to all men, even those that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgressions, Romans 5, 14 and 15, they were under, the, under sin that the figure of him that was to come, the Bible says, Jesus came as a little baby. He's talking about little babies there. Yes. And said, just as, as condemnation passed on, so does the work of Christ pass to them. Amen. You read it. God's promise that little babies that die right there in Romans chapter 5 are under the blood of Jesus and the redemption of Christ and are in heaven. I don't know if anyone in here has ever lost a little baby. You've had a miscarriage. The only verses I hear preachers talk about little kids in heaven is when David is standing at the grave of his son. But let me tell you, God inspired Paul to write it down in the book of Romans chapter 5. I think it's Romans, uh, yeah, 14 and 15. It's talking about little babies. Children that have not reached the age of understanding. Those who never come to the comprehension or, or understanding. His redemptive love and work on Calvary was for them also. Wow. Now, that's not my message. I just threw that in. I just want you to know they weren't little angels in heaven with halos around their head. They're saints of God Amen. purchased by the blood of Jesus. And verse 3, And one cry, uh, cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, hey, by the way, that smoke there you see in verse 4 won't make smoke alarms go off, but it'll sure turn your heart and life upside down. Yeah. Yep. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sins pur sin purged also. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then said I, Here am I, send me. Now I want you to focus in on two statements. First of all, in verse number one, notice the statement, I saw also the Lord. Amen. The title of my message tonight is that statement, I saw also the Lord the Lord. And then down in verse 8, also I heard the voice of the Lord. Listen, folks, I believe we as Christians in every situation we face, good or bad, need to look for the Lord Jesus Christ. God works in the providence. He works providentially in our lives. Through the everyday occurrences of our life, God works. If we'll take time and look for him, we shall see him, Amen. and our life shall be changed. Yes, Father, help me now to be a blessing and a help and an encouragement to these dear folks. Help me to preach your word in such a way that when they leave here tonight, in every occurrence of their life, good or bad, they might see the hand of God at work. I saw also the Lord. Now fill me with thy spirit and speak through me. And Lord, there's some people here tonight that need to get on the front line. And there's some people here need to cross that line by faith, trusting Christ as their Savior. And there's some people here tonight to whom you've been calling and they need to come. 
and yield their life to you as their, your servant for the rest of their life. Now, you know how you wanted to work with us tonight and deal with us, speak through us, and do a work that we'll not get over with by waking up tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Isaiah was God's prophet to the southern kingdom, Judah. He had witnessed Israel, the northern kingdom, taken into captivity by Assyria. He knew that unless Judah returned to the Lord and got right with God, that Judah would also be overrun by the Assyrian armies. Now in the previous chapters, Isaiah's warning the people about their sin and hypocrisy in worship. They had gone so far away from God that Isaiah calls them Sodom and Gomorrah in chapter 1, verse 10. Now for 52 years, Uzziah had reigned as king. Under his leadership, the nation had been blessed with every token of divine favor. The Philistines, the Arabians, the Ammonites, all had been brought into subjection. Now you, uh, King Uzziah dies. Verse 1. Now that's bad enough, but before he died, according to 2 Chronicles 26, the king allows his heart to be lifted up in pride, and he tried to take the place of a priest and burn incense on the altar in the temple. The priest withstood him, and the king uh, and God smote Uzziah with leprosy. All the days of the rest of King Uzziah's life, he was a leper, and he died a leper. With the death of King Uzziah, the national glory of Israel died out also. You see, leprosy is a picture of sin. Both the king and the nation died because of their sin. It was in this setting that Isaiah writes, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. For my message tonight, I want to emphasize this statement. I saw also the Lord. And let me tell you tonight, here is the difference between those who give up, give in, give over and give out to their situation or circumstances. Some see only the problems that exist and others lift their eyes above the problem and see also the Lord. Isaiah saw the sin of Israel and Judah and he saw the pride and presumption of Uzziah. He saw the leprosy and the death of the king, but that's not all. He looked above all of those things and saw also the Lord. And having seen the Lord above the terrible calamity of his day, verse 8, also he heard the Lord when he spoke to him. A lot of people see the problem, see the difficulty, and not Jesus. And when Jesus speaks, we don't even recognize his voice. We've got to see him in every situation of our life. And if we're going to hear his comfort, his help, and his direction for our life. And my message is very simple. Number one, to live victoriously as a Christian, we must, like Isaiah, always look above the tragedy and the sorrow of the moment and see also the Lord. When sin and evil was the way of life and the nation was living on the brink of God's judgment, Isaiah lifted his eyes above the pollution of his day and fixed his eyes on a thrice holy God. What he saw was the pre-incarnate Christ in all his eternal glory and splendor seated on the throne of glory. You read it there in Isaiah 6, 1, 2, and 3. Isaiah looked on further 
and saw Christ's incarnation in Isaiah 7, 14, when he said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. He looked on still further and saw in Isaiah 53, the Holy Son of God take our place in judgment that we might be justified before Almighty God. You can read it in Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 6. He looks on still further, and in Isaiah 60, he saw also the Lord coming in glory to set up his everlasting kingdom on this earth. That's how Isaiah made it through his tragedy. That's how we make it also. We must see also the Lord. May I say too many in our churches today are focusing on the calamity, the tragedies of our day. We're focusing on the sin of our day. We're focusing on the conflicts politically of our day when we ought to be seeing also the Lord who can give us victory through our heartaches and our trials and our difficulties. And I want you to know our Lord can do for our nation what the Republicans and the Democrats and any president can do. The Lord can do what they can't do. Yes, sir. Amen. Secondly, to win victory over our sin, we must see also the Lord. We must see him as greater than our sin. Amen. You tell me what sin is so big that the blood of Jesus cannot cleanse. What sin is so big that it can wreck your life to a point where Christ can't put it back together? To win victory over our sin, we must see also the Lord as greater than our sin. Brother Ogden mentioned David and his terrible sin with Bathsheba. And as a result of that sin, the judgment of God was op upon him because of that sin. That judgment resulted in the death of his little baby son. And he stands at the gravesite. And he gives up and quits. No. He lifts his eyes above the, the sin and above the sorrow and he sees a thrice holy God and Psalm 51 was written, written where he confesses his sin and cries out in repentance and receives God's forgiveness. Instead of just focusing on his sin or the death of his son, he saw also the Lord, a holy God, a just God, a sin-forgiving God, a life-changing God. He sees also the Lord who is able to bring meaning and purpose for life out of the chaos caused by sin. And let me tell you, David's life was filled with chaos because of his sin. Well, how many times have I heard people blame God and curse God because they've gone through a tragedy, they've lost their marriage, or they've lost a child to death, or they've ch lost a child into sin? Let me tell you, that's not God's doing. Yes, right. the, uh, the, when they curse God, they're cursing the wrong person. Right. Yes, it's the devil that's done Amen. it. Right. It's the devil who is our enemy. Amen. We better realize... Instead of cursing God, we need to see Him and realize He has power to give purpose and direction and healing and help and hope to a life. Yes, sir. David said, I cannot bring my son back, but I can go where he is only because of the provision of God. And I say again, to win victory over our sin, we must see also the Lord. Thirdly, in the times of our sorrow, we must see also the Lord. Remember in John chapter 11, a good friend of Jesus named Lazarus died. 
They got the, Jesus got the message, but he on purpose waited, and Lazarus died. And there they are at the tomb. He had been in the tomb three days already, and they said, He stinketh. And here comes Jesus. Mary and Martha weeping. Martha kept looking for Jesus. Martha, at the death of her brother, after four days, looked beyond the weeping and the sorrow and saw Jesus coming. And in the scripture, she said, had you been here, he would not have died. And then she said to those, whatsoever the Lord says for you to do, do it. Because she knew the Lord was greater than death, greater than sorrow. And I say to you, in the times of your sorrow, don't focus in just on the sorrow. Focus in on Jesus. Listen to me, folks. Jesus is applicable to everything we face in life. Yes, sir. This morning, my wife and I got up and went to a little place we like to eat breakfast. And after we finished there, we went over to Walmart to pick up a few things. And I always pray, Lord, give me a good parking place. You don't do that? Man, we're to pray about all for everything. Hey, look also for the Lord in your parking places. We pulled up there, and there's one right there in front. You know what I did? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. See the Lord in every circumstance of your life. You say, but that's so silly. not silly to him. I had a man one time I was witnessing to tell me, listen, God is not interested in the little details of your life. I said, yes, he is. Everything you're going through and everything you're dealing with, God wants to be a part of. And you better learn to see also the Lord. And in the times when we're going through storms in our life, we must look beyond the storm and see also the Lord and realize he's got a purpose in that storm. Amen. The Bible says in Nahum chapter 3, verse 1, the Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and the storms. Amen. The apostle Paul was a prisoner on a ship going to Rome. Remember in Acts chapter 27, 28, they were caught in the midst of a great storm. And for many days they fought to keep the ship afloat. They threw off everything they could throw off. They undergirded the ship. They tied ropes under the bottom of the ship from one side to the other to try to help hold it together. They hadn't eaten in a long time. And in the midst of that storm, Paul saw also the Lord. Listen to how he writes about it. Now, I love old Paul. I love Paul, and I love how he s says it. You see, before they ever left harbor, he said, we'd better not be going out there. This isn't the time for sailing. There's a lot of storms out there. Paul warned the captain, but because it wasn't commodious to winter there, the captain ignored him and went on. Acts 27, verse 21 <clears throat> through 24, listen. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed me loose from Crete to have gained this harm and loss. Paul said, I told you so. I love it. Paul was human too. He reminded them, he warned them, and he said, Now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. There was 276 people on that ship. 
Paul said not one's going to lose their life. The ship's going to be lost, but not one soul. How do you know, Paul? For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. That ship broke up. And they floated ashore to a little island, Miletus, a pagan island. They floated on boards and whatever they could get a hold of. And there they evangelized. They proclaimed the gospel. Remember, Paul was bitten by a snake. And he shook it off in the fire and they worshiped him as God. And Paul preached to him a little longer and then they began to, to want to try to destroy them and kill them. Hey, beware when people love you one minute. Next minute, they may be trying to crucify you. But Jesus won't do you that way. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Even in the midst of the storm, we must look beyond the storm and see Jesus. He saw also the Lord. Remember the disciples? Brother Ogden mentioned it. There's on a little boat in the Sea of Galilee. They were caught in a storm. They saw also the Lord walking on the water. And you know what Jesus said? Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Ah, uh, listen. When we're going through storms, we better look beyond the storm and see also the Lord. See, that was a divinely prescribed storm. It had a divine purpose to teach them to have faith in Christ. He is bigger than the storms of our life. It was an opportunity for personal growth so Peter could do something that could not be done apart from faith in Christ. He walked on the water. He said, Lord, beckon me, and I'll walk to you on the water. And Jesus said, come on. And old Peter stepped out of that boat, and the Bible says he walked on the water. Now, I don't know how far he walked. He saw the boisterous waves and began to sink, but I want to go back. Peter walked on the water. God said so in his boat. Whether it was one step or two steps or ten steps, he walked on the water. And let me tell you, when we lift our eyes above the storms we're going through and see also the Lord, we'll find that we can have victory over the storms of our life. And then may I say in those times of shame, when we feel as though we're miserable failures, we must be able to say, I saw also the Lord. Remember Moses? He was in exile in the Midian desert. He had fled Egypt for his life. He had gotten ahead of God like many I know today do. And he tried by his own strength to deliver Israel. He killed an Egyptian and he buried him in the sand. I don't know how they found out whether a storm blew up that night and the wind blew and uncovered that Egyptian, but they found out. And he fled for his life to Midian. For 40 years he'd been trained in the courts of Pharaoh. And now he's a fugitive in a Midian, the Midian desert. And for 40 years now, on the backside of the desert, God is teaching him how to lead sheep and goats. There were a mixed multitude that came out. But for 40 years, then one day, on the backside of that desert, in those 40 years of exile and shame when he felt like a miserable failure. He saw something. Here was a bush suddenly that began to blaze. And it burnt, but it was not consumed. And Moses stood aside, went aside to see it, and 
He heard the voice of God, speak out of that bush, take off thy shoes, for where you're standing is holy ground. And there God called him to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Oh, I say to you, my dear friends, he heard the voice from the bush, a voice that was above the, the shame and the regret of some failure in the past. He saw also the Lord. And for the next 40 years, he leads Israel out of bondage to the very border of the promised land. And in the book of Hebrews, verse 26, God writes about Moses. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. He kept his eyes above the shame and the hurt and the heartache. There's not a person here that hadn't experienced hurt. There's people out in this area that's out of church tonight because they experienced hurt. Yes, and they focused on their hurt and their bitterness. Yes, right. And then there are those who have been hurt. And in the midst of that deep hurt and heartache or even shame, they saw also the Lord. Yes. And they're still serving God. They're still living for God. They're still doing what God wants them to do for Him. I say to you, in those times of shame, when we feel as though we're miserable failures, we must also be able to say, I saw not just my shame and my failure, I saw also the Lord. And then... In the times of our suffering, we must lift our eyes above the pain and see also the Lord. Yes. A lot of Christians suffer. Some suffer hurt for the cause of Christ. Some suffer through physical illness. Some suffer because of sin. But there's one greater than our suffering, and that's our Savior. In the times of our suffering, we must lift our eyes above the pain and see also the Lord. Remember John the Apostle, exiled to the rocky snake-infested island called Patmos? He did not die there in defeat and self-pity, but there on that island he bowed himself before the Lord on the Lord's day in the spirit and saw also the Lord and he turned that prison island into a cathedral and there he worshiped God. That's good. Amen. And God said, John, I want to show you something I've not shown anybody else. And he gave to him the revelation, Amen. the book of the revelation, the book of end time events. Because in the midst of his pain and suffering, he lifted his eyes above the pain and the suffering and saw also the Lord. One more thing and I'll be through tonight. Hey, by the way, I've got to say this. Look to Jesus in that time of suffering. You see... He knows what it is to suffer alone. Because there on Calvary, that holy fellowship and union between Jesus and God the Father was broken. Broken to the place where Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, in order for God to judge Jesus for our sin, He was made sin to, to become sin for us. And God cannot look upon sin. So God turned His back upon His own Son in order to judge His sin, yours and mine. That's the only sin He had. Your sin and my sin, and God judged him. Yes, sir. 
He knows what it is to suffer alone. And you don't have to suffer alone. Lift your eyes above the suffering of your day and see Jesus. You know what he said to us after suffering and bleeding and dying? He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then lastly, when thinking about your lost condition and your need of salvation, it's imperative to see also the Lord. There's one Savior. There's one salvation. There's one way. There's not two ways or three ways. Every religion does not have a way. There's only one way. There's not a Baptist way and a Catholic way. There's not a Methodist way and a Lutheran way. There's one way, and that way is Jesus. And you want to be saved if you don't see Jesus and trust Jesus as your Savior, you're not going to be saved. For He alone can forgive our sin, and He alone can save our soul. The rich fool saw his riches and died without hope. Yes, sir. But one, one day in Jericho, along the roadside, sat an old beggar named Bartimaeus, blind. And he heard Jesus was passing by. And old blind Bartimaeus, in his blindness, Though he was physically blind, spiritually, he had 20-20 vision because he knew it was Jesus who could save him and only Jesus. And he cried out, Lord, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the Bible says Jesus stopped. He stood still. He healed his blindness and saved his soul because blind Bartimaeus didn't just see the darkness of his, caused by his blindness. He saw also the Lord, and he trusted him. That's what I did. Yes, sir. August the 23rd, 1954, as a 15-year-old boy. I sat back there on the back row in a revival meeting in a little auditorium that wasn't as big as this one. Didn't have padded pews and air conditioning. I sat back there where all the boys had carved their initials on the church pew and stuck their bubble gum and gum underneath it. I sat back there while the preacher preached and God was working me over. I knew I was lost. And what seemed like the 23rd verse of just as I am, the preacher stopped and said, listen, we're going to sing one more verse. God's speaking to somebody. One more verse. If nobody comes, it's over. And God said, this is your verse. Amen. And I came down that aisle, and that night I trust Jesus as my Savior. Amen. He changed my life. Yes. He's given me a life worth living here in heaven to look forward to in eternity to come because I saw also the Lord Jesus as Savior. Have you? Have you? Father, that's our message, how we need you. How foolish it is to think we can make it successfully through this life with all the hurts and the storms and the heartaches and the problems and the suffering how we can make it without you. Teach us tonight to lift our eyes above the things that are going on today and the world is focusing on and help us to see Jesus also and understand he's the answer. He's the way. He's the hope. Now, Lord, I felt led to preach this message tonight on this last service last hour of this meeting because I want these dear folks to be able to go out of here and realize there's one greater than our storms. There's one greater than our sorrow. There's one that's greater than our suffering. There's one greater than our heartaches and failures and our shame. 
There's one greater than all our sin. Help us in that time that we're going through to see also the Lord and turn to Him who gives us meaning and purpose and hope and life. And in these next few moments of invitation, have your way. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me ask the question. If you died tonight, right now where you're seated. You do understand before the undertaker could pick up your body, you'd already be in hell, burning and suffering if you're without Jesus Christ as Savior. Do you know that you're saved? Do you know that it's settled? Why go through life not knowing when it can be something that's settled and you can be 100% certain on the basis of the honesty of God and the finished work of Jesus that your sins are forgiven, you're saved, and heaven's your home. I wonder how many of you can say it with that kind of certainty. Preacher, I'm saved and I know it. There's no doubt about it. If Jesus came today or I should die where I'm seated, it's all right, I'm saved. Slip your hand up right now and give testimony. I'm saved and I know it. No doubt about it. Saved and I know it. Every hand in here is lifted. God bless you. You can put them down. Now, as a Christian, you don't have to leave here tonight and go through your heartaches, your suffering, your sorrow, your trials and burdens alone. Lift your eyes and see also the Lord. Yes, the burden will be real, but Jesus is real too. And focus on him tonight, for he has hope and help when we do. Let's stand right now and as the piano begins to play. If you need